Hi folks, welcome back to our Vulcan tutorial series. In part 2, we will be covering the various types of engine starting that can be accomplished in the Vulcan, as well as configuring the aircraft ready for takeoff. There are two basic methods that can be used to start the engines in the Vulcan, normal and rapid. As per the name, a normal engine start will be used in normal operating conditions, and the rapid start would typically be reserved for wartime conditions, where the aircraft needs to be airborne in a matter of minutes. But it can also be useful for starting the engines if an external air source is not connected to the aircraft. The tutorial flight covers the rapid start procedure as that's something not often found in other aircraft, so we'll cover that first, but we'll then touch on a few other methods of engine starting too. Now that we are in the aircraft, We'll run through a few items that we already ran through in the first part of this tutorial series just to confirm that we did accomplish them and that all the switches are set in the correct position. So first we just want to double check that all engine covers are removed from the aircraft. We can do that by clicking the covers option on the EFB. We need to check that the area surrounding the aircraft is clear of obstructions and then move the nav light switch to flash to illuminate the beacon lights. On the centre console, we can switch on all the fuel tank pumps and confirm the auto manual switches are set to auto with the crossfeed switches set to closed. The HP cocks are currently in the shut position, so we need to move them into the open slash idling position. We can do that by clicking the base of each throttle lever to move them out of the detent. And then we can advance the throttles to approximately 50% for the rapid start. Moving to the very aft end of the left side console, we find the engine start panel. We can set the air selector switch to rapid and the ignition and engine master switches to on, confirming that the air crossfeed mechanical indicator shows open. We are now ready to initiate the rapid start sequence. Press the rapid start button when ready and confirm that all four engine start lights illuminate. On the centre instrument panel, we can monitor the oil pressure, fuel flow, JPT and RPM gauges to confirm that all four engines are spooling up and ensure that none of the engine fire warning lights illuminate. Confirmation of four successful engine starts is shown by the four engine start lights extinguishing and once this occurs we can switch off the ignition and engine master switches and bring the throttle levers back to the idle position. Now that we've run through the rapid start procedure, let's walk through a normal start. We've got the aircraft set up in the exact same configuration as we had previously, right up to setting up the engine start panel. The difference with a normal engine start is we first need to ensure the pollution is connected and supplying air to the aircraft, and we need to set the engine air switch of the engine we are starting to open. We can then set the ignition and engine master switches to on, set the air selector switch to normal, and press the respective engine start button to start the engine. The typical order for starting the engines in the Vulcan is 4, 3, 2, and then 1. Once RPM indicates 12%, we can open the HP cock on the starting engine, and we'll see a rise in RPM, JPT, and oil pressure. With one engine started and the start light extinguished, we can then repeat this process for the other three engines. So engine air switch on, then engine start button pressed. Or if we didn't have the pollution connected, we could use bleed air from the already running engine to start the remaining engines. So to show this, 
If we disconnect the Palust on the EFB and let it shut down, we can then set the engine 3 and engine 4 air switches to open, increase the RPM in the running engine to 70% and then press the engine 3 start button. If no external air was connected to the aircraft in the first place, you can also use the rapid start function to start a single engine. So in this example, we can set the air selector switch to rapid and then press one of the engine start buttons. We will start the engine using the compressed air from one of the onboard air cylinders and with one engine running, you can then use cross bleed air to start the other engine. With the engine started, we can now run through the after start checks and get the aircraft configured ready for flight. Moving to the AEO position in the rear cockpit, we can switch on the four alternators and confirm that the four amber lights extinguish. We can then switch on both 28 volt transformer rectifier units. Returning to the front cockpit, we can perform a test of the air brake emergency and normal motors. To do this, extend and retract the air brakes and confirm that the mechanical indicator displays the corresponding position. Now may be a good time to explain the three different air brake positions. The first position is with the air brakes fully retracted. The second position is the medium drag position. And the third position is the high drag position. The high drag position is variable in itself, as the high drag position is different with the undercarriage extended versus the undercarriage retracted. With the undercarriage retracted, the high drag position produces less drag than with the undercarriage extended. Continuing on the testing theme, using the bomb bay door normal operating selector on the left console, open the bomb doors and confirm the mechanical indicator shows a cross hatch whilst the doors are in motion and then white when they are fully open. We can then retract the doors again by rotating the selector back to close and confirming that the mechanical indicator shows black once the doors are fully closed. On the left side console, we can switch on the powered flying controls. To do this, we have three PFC start buttons on the left side console. To start the powered flying controls, we press these buttons in order of aileron, elevon, rudder with a one second gap between each button press. After a short period all 10 powered flying control lights should be extinguished and the artificial field lights on the right side of the panel should also be extinguished. If these three lights do not extinguish the buttons may still be in the depressed position so you'll need to pull each of these three buttons up and then again press the PFC start buttons in order. At the top of the panel, 
The pitch dampers and the auto trim lights are still illuminated, so to extinguish these lights, we just need to pull each of the buttons up. We can also now set the yaw damper to number 1. With all lights extinguished on the PFC panel, we can then perform a functional test at flying controls. As we move the control column, we can view the position of the flying controls on the indicator on the central instrument panel. With the engine started and producing electrical power, we can remove the ground equipment by clicking the ground power and pollution options on the EFB. We can close the crew door by clicking the crew door icon and notice that the cockpit gets significantly quieter. And then we can also remove the chocks. Briefly changing to the external camera will show that everything is clear of the aircraft and it is ready for taxi. Returning to the alternator control panel in the rear cockpit, we can synchronise all the alternators to the synchronising bus bar, confirm that all mechanical indicators show inline, indicating that all alternators are connected to the synchronising bus bar. We can then isolate alternators 1, 3 and 4, and confirm that alternator 2 is still connected to the synchronising bus bar and supplying power to the aircraft. Whilst we're in the rear cockpit, we can start to set up our navigation instruments for our flight. We won't be making use of the GPS unit in the Vulcan for this flight. Instead, we'll be navigating using TACANs, VORs, NDBs and ILS, traditional navigation methods used by real Vulcan aircrews. As we already know our route today, we can preset the channel for the first TACAN on our route which is Wittering 123 X-Ray. So on the navigation panel, we can set 1, 2 with the left knob and 3 with the right knob, set the XY switch to X, and then set the mode switch to TR. Once we are airborne and within line of sight of the Wittering Takan station, a bearing and distance to the Takan station will be displayed on the Takan indicator in the centre of the main instrument panel. As we plan ahead, we can also tune in the Daventry VOR, which we will use further into the flight. On the two radio selectors on the left side console, tune in 116.4, and if not already set, set the mode selector to TR plus G. For setting the nav frequency in the Vulcan, we would recommend enabling tooltips in the Microsoft Flight Simulator options menu. Alternatively, you can use the radio menu on the EFB to view the current frequency tuned into the NAV1 radio and also adjust the frequency using the plus and minus buttons. With the frequency for the Daventry VOR set, once we are within range of the VOR, bearing and distance will be displayed on the beam compass. Continuing on the left side console, we can switch on the radio altimeter, set the range scale to 500 feet and use the test switch to confirm that the scale reads between 55 and 75 feet. Once this test is complete, the radio altimeter can be set back to its default range of 5000 feet. We can leave this panel turned on for some situational awareness during our departure but the standard procedure for the Vulcan would be to turn this panel off for departure and only use it for low level flights. As we prepare to move the aircraft, we can now store the ejector seat pins by left clicking on any one of them and they will then be stored in the holder above the left and right side consoles. On the right side console, we can switch on the pressure head heaters and extend the left and right taxi lights. And with that, we're now ready to taxi to the runway. As the wind is calm today, we'll be departing from runway 20 and then turning left to a heading of approximately 160 degrees 
to fly directly towards the Witteren Takan station. Check that the area around the aircraft is clear of obstacles and then release the parking brake, apply power and slowly get the aircraft rolling as we start a taxi towards the threshold of runway 20. Now may be a good time to explain the steering system in the Vulcan. Now we have an option in the settings menu of the EFB which is called realistic steer. By default this option is disabled and that means that the nose wheel steering can always be controlled by the rudder pedals. Now that isn't 100% realistic to the Vulcan because in the Vulcan you have a nose wheel steer and push button at the bottom of each control column. So in the real Vulcan, you would only be able to move the nose wheel steering if that button was depressed. With the realistic steer option enabled on the AFB, that's the logic we add in. So if you've got that option enabled, you need to make sure that the push button at the bottom of the control column is pushed in in order for the nose wheel steering to work. As we approach the whole shore point of runway 20, we can come to a stop and apply the parking brake. Again we can perform a full and free movement check of the flying control surfaces and confirm that all power flying control lights are still extinguished. We can then set the nav and pitch selectors to the central positions. This will allow the flight directors to provide guidance to the Takan station once in range and if the track knob is pulled on the autopilot panel. It should be noted that the track knob needs to be pulled even if the autopilot is not engaged in order for the flight directors to provide guidance to the Navid. On the beam compass we can rotate the heading index knob with the mouse wheel to align the runway heading of 198 degrees with the top datum. Returning to the rear cockpit and the AEO's position, we can check that all alternators are on. The AAPP is on the synchronising bus bar by pressing the AAPP on button. The 115 volt transformers are on and all indications are normal. For takeoff and landing, all electrical power to the aircraft is provided by the AAPP, so it's important that the AAPP is connected to the synchronising bus bar during takeoffs and landings. We can now work out our takeoff speeds. So using the rotation and initial climb speeds table on the screen, we can deduce that at our current aircraft weight which is rounded up to 180,000 pounds, we will have a rotation speed of 148 knots 
and an initial climb speed of 156 knots. As we prepare to enter the runway, we can set the landing lamps to landing, set the number one and number two engine air switches to open, and set the port cabin air switch to open. With the before takeoff checks complete, verify that there's nothing on the approach, the runway is clear, and we can taxi onto the runway. With the aircraft now on the runway, we'll end part 2 of this tutorial series here. If you found this part useful, we'd love for you to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel and share the video with your friends. In part 3, we will cover the takeoff, climb and cruise.